It's time now for the Todd Leonard Show. Leave those negative stories behind as we focus on the positive and hear from those who give back and help others. Let's start your day with some inspirational stories. Now, here's your host, Todd Leonard. Good morning, everyone. We have an outstanding show. You know, each week... I think about who can I bring on that really embodies what our show is about. Those that give back, those that lift up the community, those that are always looking to put a hand up to help others in need. And this is one of the beautiful, magical parts of the show is when I find a guy like Jack Crilly, because we're going to be talking with Jack today. Jack and his wonderful family have gone through a lot in life. But one of the things about Jack and his family is they're resilient. They're strong. They're courageous. We're going to talk with Jack today about the loss of his beloved daughter right before she turned five. And despite such adversity, he's been able to rise above that and create a fund in her honor, the Mary Therese Rose Fund. Jack, good morning, sir. Morning, Todd. You know, it's a real privilege to have you come on this morning. You know, I know we had a little bit of a chat before we started, and, you know, just a wonderful person. And, you know, thank you for taking your time out away from your family today to kind of take us on the journey of Jack, your wonderful family, and everything you've gone through. So, so Jack, for the listeners, where are you from? Well, I was reared in Franklin Lakes, and uh, my wife and I now reside in Wanakew, New Jersey. Wonderful. And, um, you know, one of the things that I was so, you know, I was really, really thinking about the show today, because I, I know it's very emotional. I have young kids, and, you know, I was thinking about everything you've gone through. So I want to, you know, if you can take us a little bit on the journey. So I want to talk about, you know, your beloved lost daughter, Mary Therese Rose. Um Tell us a little bit about uh, 1998 when you're blessed when she was born. What, what was happening? Yeah, so um, we, well, my wife and I had three children, identical twins, and then my son. Um, and then we got news that we were expecting our fourth. In the third trimester, we were told that she was going to be disabled, something called Dandy Walker. I don't want to get too medical here or whatever, but... Um, What ended up happening is when she was born, she wasn't presenting with those symptoms, and she was far more severe. She'd go from breathing about 200 breaths a minute to not breathing, and it was a mystery. She'd go from blue to okay or whatever, and she was in all kinds of distress. Um, She was out of the Valley Hospital, um, and the attending physician was Dr. Frank Manginello, who I'll weave this back in, happens to be now president of the Mary Therese Rose Fund that we named. But um, as we figured it out and we went to geneticist, she was diagnosed with something called Joubert syndrome. What Joubert syndrome is, and again, not trying to get too medical, but three major parts of your brain and you have the cerebellum. And there's a connective tissue called the vermis. She was born absent that, but the severity of her, she also had a malformed brainstem. So the functions that we take for granted, such as breathing, which is regulated by your brainstem, and some of the other functions like just digestion, um, the doctors at the Valley Hospital basically had to synthesize a brainstem medically. So she was ventilator dependent, feeding tube dependent had the biggest smile in the world, she'd draw you in. So we had 24-7 nursing care in our home for that five-year period or whatever. And I have to say, and the nurses to this day are our friends, they so enjoyed taking care of Mary. She drew them in. She had a huge smile. Um, You probably saw on the website a picture of her. That was her. Through all her discomfort, she smiled. Yeah, I, I saw her beautiful eyes, and I, and I know that um, as we, we talked about, um, you know, a little bit in advance of the show, just um, what a beautiful young treasure she was. So I know you're a CPA by training. I know you're very smart. I know you have a tremendous financial background. Um, you're, you're with the Bank of America? Bank of America, private bank in New York City. Right. So I know you're very smart. And hopefully by the time the show ends, you'll still feel smart that I dragged you onto the show. But when you found out that your daughter had this Jobert syndrome, and I I did a little research on it, and I can only imagine. I mean, I'm assuming you try to educate yourself as much as you could. Well, I think it's more common than they initially thought. We were told that there were 100 live births in the world each year at that time. We've anecdotally seen more than that or whatever, but it was a a bit of a mystery. 
Um, and the education process, I mean, we became the experts because it was so much off the charts. I think that the medical care was somewhat reactive um, because people didn't really know what it was. But, um, you know, so we were at Columbia Presbyterian seeing pediatric neurologists and a lot of different places. But so, but the the group that did the most research was out of Montefiore. There was a wonderful pediatric neurologist by the name of Isabel Rappin and her team. And they actually met with Marie Joubert, whom the syndrome was named after at a conference up in Montreal, um, and reported back to us, and that's when we really began to understand. But the, the the die was cast. We just had to keep her comfortable. Right. So when you found out that you know Mary Therese Rose had these profound um, disabilities, uh, what is that like as parents? I mean, um, how, how did you deal with it? Well, you know, and and I'm not. I'm not saying that, you know, whether it be the husband or the wife, what the roles are, but we all assimilate roles in a marriage. My wife being a pediatric physical therapist, she was the primary caregiver uh, with the 24-7 nurse, nursing staff, and she had to coordinate all that or whatever, and I just had to grind it out and do what I did. I had to make a living and make sure that we could, you know, support everything overall, um, you know, I used to try to make her laugh and joke, and then her <laughs> medical numbers would go off the charts, and the nurses, my wife, would get mad at me, whatever, but she had a right to enjoy, right? I mean, so I would make her laugh or whatever, but, you know, it was, um, I, what, I, I knew some things, but I wasn't as hands-on as as were the nurses and my wife. Yeah, you know, I, I feel so strongly about nurses. I always think nurses are angels. My, my late parents always said it, especially my dad. So, I mean, nurses have a special place in my heart. How do you feel about the nurses? Oh, my. I mean, and to this day, um, you know, in the event you're talking about, they still show up. I mean, they became part of our household. Um, but... You know, just the hours and the, the the overnight hours and the level of dedication. And, you know, they don't take it clinically. They take it home with them. They, they love these kids. They don't just they don't just leave it behind. And I think that that's probably one of the most stressful aspects is that you just can't walk. If you're a good nurse and the level of compassion, you just can't leave it in the workplace. Yeah. Whereas other things we can leave in the workplace. No question. I know with COVID, I, I had a, you know, a nurse on and, and talk about the level of commitment and devotion, the frontline heroes. I mean, God bless everyone that was serving so ably and really put their lives on the line. And as you said, took it home. I mean, the toll, yeah. with the tremendous loss of lives as well. So one of the beautiful things, though, Jack, about you and your families, how your daughter lived in those almost five years on earth. And I know how important smile was in bringing joy in her life. So can you tell the listeners some of the things that you and your wife and your kids were able to do with Mary to, to brighten her day? Well, we just tried to keep the, as much normalcy as possible, meaning we still went on trips, but we'd have to bring a nurse. Um, and, um, you know, one, one interesting story is um, we like to vacation up in the Adirondacks up in Lake George so we had to make arrangements and I I got a special little cabin for the nurse and for, for Mary um, and then we had our own little cabin because it came with equipment you know we had to bring all kinds of equipment and nurses would come up one of our nurses um, and she just recently retired God bless her, her name's Claudia Kretschmann in the day came in fourth in the world in the Ironman Triathlon one of our nurses okay um, and this is an example of the craziness that we had and what, what made life so fun, so endearing, this different path that we were on. We were staying at Lake George, and I like to fish. And I'll never forget Claudia doing a night shift for us. So she and her husband would come up, and they actually had a camper, and so they were kind of vacationing with the family or whatever. And I'm out on the water, and all of a sudden I see this splashing. She's working out. She got done with her 7 o'clock shift, hopped in the lake, and swam her miles back and forth. I'm like, oh, my God. Well, <laughs> that's a bit extreme, but that's the caliber of person that we we had integrated into our life. So, you know, we would do that and, and travel and, um, you know, just do the best that we could and um, had the conversion van. And, you know, we'd say, let's hop in the van and go to the boardwalk and, you know, and. You just try to keep his level of normalcy because there were three other children in the household. Right. I mean, well. I'm sure yeah. the kids, all your, all your beloved children pull together, I'm assuming, and try to, you know, band together and help Mary and help yourselves kind of 
come to grips with the disabilities? Well, and, you know, Todd, I, I know that we've spoken about this as well, but the impact of that is, is that what my, that is the field my three children have gone into. So it's had an impact on them, uh, certainly changed their lives. My three adult children are all serving special needs. Wonderful. I mean, incredible. So I know you were telling us all, you know, telling me in advance uh, why I wanted to focus on how your daughter lived. Um, you guys were able to go on some carnival rides with her, some horseback riding. You did everything you could to give her a level of normalcy. Yeah, I mean... Um yeah, crazy as it was, having these battery-powered ventilators with someone carrying it nearby. Um, yeah, we did everything that we could. You'd go on a, you know, on a, a, a merry-go-round, and someone would be holding the ventilator, and she'd be going up and down the horse being held. You, you just you accommodate. You do what you need to do. Um, well, it's, it's an awesome thing. So when you um, when you realized your daughter had this this syndrome, Joe Bear syndrome. When did you create a fund? What was the time that you and your family decided you were going to create a fund uh, in her name? I didn't. A friend kind of imposed it on me. And I'll, I'll tell you the story. He happens to be a local trust and estate attorney, a fellow. He, he practices, I think, out of Livingston, now, Rob Bortek. Um, you know, when you live in the situation, Sometimes other people are more concerned or, I shall say, devastated for you than you are because you've got to live your life, you know, and, and, and it just becomes part of your day. Rob made a donation to the Valley Hospital Foundation in the name of my daughter. Um, and I then got a phone call from the foundation, um, the, the head of the Valley Hospital Foundation, uh, a woman by the name of Ann Swenson, and she said, you know, we just got this donation. What do you want to do with it? And I just kind of spur of the moment thought of the idea that we would say create a fund that would benefit the children. So we kind of went along in that manner, and we would just get, you know, miscellaneous contributions. But they're payable to the Valley Hospital Foundation, and then I was told, well, look, the auditors are going to stop us because the foundation must be for the benefit of the hospital, not the individual's. So back, and it was a couple of months after my daughter had passed in 03, I spun the organization out of the hospital foundation, got the IRS designation, um, you know, uh, all the paperwork, 501c3 and whatever, and started really the Mary Therese Rose Fund, Inc. It was a sub-account of the Valley Hospital, and that was really the beginning. It was just one, f one friend cutting a check, um, you know, at that time. But interesting, you know, Todd, and I, I think I shared this story with you. You think back of, you know, what, what was the first, like, real big moment? And I recall that I had a friend. Actually, he was uh, an insurance agent that I'd referred to, and he wanted to donate. So it just so happens that we got a, a request for a custom-made bicycle for an autistic child. And the story goes is that the manufacturer or the creator of this happened to be a creator of custom-made NHL hockey equipment in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So we find this guy. He custom-makes his bicycle. It looks like one of those big old-fashioned tricycles with the big wheel in the front. And there's a platform in the back with a handbrake so that the supervisor or parent can stand on this platform with a handbrake so the kid can't get in too much trouble. And the child's pedaling the bike and steering in the front. So this thing gets created. It just so happens that this friend of mine contributes a check to pay for this bicycle. And we're waiting. And this boy was a Jewish boy, autistic boy. And at the time, the Valley Hospital, it's called the Valley Hospital Child for Center Development, was on Gothel Road in Ridgewood for people who know that area right across from the poultry farm. And in the back parking lot, we get this bicycle on the first day of Hanukkah. And we put the kid on the bike. And my wife's on there, okay, and, and then she's showing the father how to do it. And everyone's so thrilled. The bike's working great. And everyone's celebrating. We left the kid on the bike, and the kid starts pedaling away. So he's pedaling across the parking lot. Everyone's, oh, no, oh, no. And this thing was supposed to be tip-proof. Not so much. The thing tipped over, and the kid went and did a face plant right into the macadam. And my wife's like, oh, my God, I'm going to get sued. Oh, what's going to happen or whatever? And you know what the father said to us? He goes, 
you know, on this first day of Hanukkah, he goes, my son fell off a bike. That's a miracle. I mean, and think of those parents saying that. My son fell off a bike. His son's all bloodied and bruised or whatever, and they were celebrating it. So that, that kind of tells you a lot. Yeah, I mean, talk about the, the irony, right, is your wonderful organization is able to deliver a bike. And, and, you know, on the first day of Hanukkah, and you just highlighted the father wanted his son to have that childhood, to have that experience. Yes. How'd that make you feel when you saw the dad and his response? What, what was your, like, reaction to it inside? First relief. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> to be honest with you, particularly for my wife, because she has her pop mouth practice. Pop, I mean, the excitement of the moment, you know, or whatever. Um, you know, at that moment, we were kind of thrilled. But then you look back at that and you compartmentalize that in terms of what has evolved into the greater mission, um, you know, and uh, that an organization such as this is not just child-focused, it's family-focused. You're supporting the entire family by supporting that child. Yeah, you know, one of the wonderful things is, I know Valley Hospital, you have a very close relationship with them. And um, you mentioned, is it Frank Mangiello? Manginello. Manginello. Yes. yes. Manginello. Um, and you, you were telling me uh, that he was a visionary. He's a visionary. Um what does that mean, uh, Frank's relationship with you and, and being a visionary? Well, it's funny how life just comes around in a circle. But um, my wife um, originally was just a general physical therapist and mostly she wanted neurology. And at the time, early in her career, she was mostly doing geriatrics. When my twins that are now 34 were born... I think at that time, Frank was at Valley Hospital for two weeks. He used to be at St. Joe's. And he had a little closet that they they called the transitional facility. It wasn't even a NICU yet. Um, and that's where we first met Dr. Manginello um, and just his technical excellence. I mean, the, the twins, they're preemies, no, no issues really, except some things of prematurity. But his bedside manner, his ability, uh, you know, to communicate for you to understand medically what was going on was just superb. Um, and he really stood out to us at that time. So he kept in touch with my wife. Um, and my wife was at a private practice. And when she was ready to move on, she called up Frank. Frank kind of made room for her overall. And my wife was one of the early hirees of the Center for Child Development. So you go from a young doctor going to a little closet at Valley Hospital, building out a NICU, and building out all of the aftercare that went with it, that at the time was the Center for Child Development that they subsequently got a grant for. It's now called the Carriker Center in Paramus. Um, to build all that out and to have the staff that they have, um, you know, that, that emanated from one man, um, one sole neonatologist coming over from St. Joe's. Yeah, you know, one person can really change the world. So for the listeners, so this fund gets created and and family. So who who does this fund serve? Um, how, do, how does that work with the folks? Yeah, and I know, Todd, that, that we had spoken about this or whatever, but, you know, I'm trying to be, you know, this is the CPA side of me, and trying to be very efficient with it. And one of the decisions that we did come up with is that we couldn't get too large. And what do I mean by that? We just had to know our network. Our network is the Valley Hospital Network. Our network is that character center. So because of that, um, the children that we cared for are cared for at the character center. We know the social workers. We know the other therapists. We know the physicians on staff. That's where the need is identified overall. And... Um, you know, the one thing, and because of that, we don't financially needs test because I'm not going to pass judgment on that. People get locked into lifestyles, and there's a psychological impact of that as well. You know, so you can have a young couple that might, you know, buy a house that's a stretch for them, and then they have a, a, a you know, a, a special needs child with very heavy financial needs, and one has to back out of the workforce. I can't judge that. You, you know, you just have to help the family without making those judgments. 
Right. So so if let's say, for example, someone that is being served at Valley Hospital, they have a, a child with special needs, uh, disabilities. Is that when your fund steps in and, and, and provides various um, services or various activities? So it's at various levels. Um, you know, so we might have an autistic child that's not medically fragile that we have a Saturday Stars program. It might be that level of involvement. It's very specific to the child and what the team at Valley Hospital assesses to be the need overall. Um, you know, I don't know if this is, I mean, shall I segue into the different areas of of support that we provide? Or? Yeah, you know what I'd like to do, though, Jack, for the listeners, if they want to contribute to your fund, um, how do they reach you? How do they reach the fund? Well, we have a website. It's basically www.marytherezrose.org. Therese spelt T-H-E-R-E-S-E, not Teresa. People make that. So it's Mary Therese Rose. Um, you could just put it in, you know, comes up on Google rather easily. Um, MTRF is what we go by. Um, so, yes, it's it's available on the website, um, all the information that you might need. So can you outline, like, just some of the things that you provide to the families um, to help their kids? So we go from the necessary to the fun. How's that? Um, and some of them, you know, intersect. Early on in the fund, we did an awful lot of therapeutic horseback riding, which we still do. Um, and uh, there's there's a couple of different providers or whatever, but we had occupational therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists that were trained in therapeutic riding or hippotherapy. Um, and uh, so we would... Uh, reimbursed for that as well. And the kids would be in a stealth way getting their therapy and having fun, right? So you would combine the two activities. Um, and horses have amazing benefits, and particularly these special saddles that the child has to balance all the time and everything. So that's one large area that we do. Um, in terms of the necessity and our relationship with Valley Hospital, we'll identify a family in need, and we have a quote-unquote list and Valley has provided a dedicated billing clerk. And what they'll do is they'll take the cases that's cared for at the Carriker Center, all the therapy bills that they might have. And that's not, that's, you know, speech as well, speech, audiology, PTOT. They'll submit to insurance. And then basically what happens is, you know, whether it's within their, their copay or whatever, or they're over their limit. The hospital will take a look and they'll say, okay, this child owes, you know, $1,000, all right, in terms of what insurance will pay. We'll pay 500 and the hospital writes off the other 500 So the child will get full services. So that's the that, that level of support. We used to spend an awful lot on durable medical equipment, standards, walkers, bathing systems, um, and some other things, some some other fun activities, um, you know, uh, uh, sports wheelchairs, um, all-terrain wheelchairs. Um, so we used to pay for that, but what we found over time was the amount of waste in that particular system for durable medical equipment. So one of the gentlemen who's really stepped up um, be before working as an orthotist founded something called Mary's Closet. His name is Ken Sher. And um, Ken runs, uh, along with one of our parents, a woman named Janet Caro, something called Mary's Closet. We literally have a storage locker in Hawthorne, New Jersey, that we store gently used medical equipment and lend it out to families. And Ken's a professional, makes the adjustments, makes sure that it's clean and everything, so we support them in terms of durable medical equipment. Um also, um, there's uh, other activities. We have our Saturday Stars program. What Saturday Stars is, is that, uh, and, and again, this is kind of what we've evolved into very grassroots. We had a little girl who, with severe cerebral palsy who wanted to be a ballet dancer. Mother was heartbroken. And through that community, we happened to know a PT who, in the day before she went in the field, was a dancer. It started out as dancing. And then it's expanded to piano, you know, and, and other areas, uh, music, fine arts, 
social skills. It's called Saturday Stars. It's held out of the Community Presbyterian Church in Ringwood, New Jersey, who generously donates their space to us on Saturday mornings. Um, our director is Michelle Hans, and she puts together quite a few different programs. So we have that kind of as a group setting and as a group function overall. Um, you know, and then dental visits. So there are dentists that have a certain feel for special needs kids, right? I mean, it's horrifying to a lot of us to go to the dentist. Imagine being a special needs child. So we'll pay for those outside bills. So all of those different things um, is are, are kind of what we do. So, you know, something, Jack, which I found striking um, is how you're really lifting up the special kids, their families, they're getting involved in activities that the general public takes for granted. Because if, you, um, unfortunately, if you have a child that has these disabilities, uh, I'm assuming as a parent, you want to bring a, as much normalcy as you can. And so that's a beautiful story that someone with cerebral palsy has a chance to be a ballerina or someone's going to learn how to play the piano or whatever they're into. That, that's a beautiful, wonderful thing. One of the things that, uh, if I recall, is the families. Uh, you, you were telling me in our pre-interview with it's like a fraternity, and I, I want to explore that, just the, the camaraderie between the various families. What does that mean to you, Jack, and your organization? Well, it's something that evolved that, you know, it's one of the unintended benefits that, that I never imagined was going to evolve. And I and it really emanated from the, um, from the Saturday Stars program, because as these parents would drive to Community Presbyterian at length, They'd go to breakfast. They would sit there. They would network. They would make suggestions to us. We would try to be responsive. So, you know, when people say, what is the Mary Therese Rose Fund now? I kind of say it's a fraternity with a checkbook. I mean, that's really what it is at this point because the board um, and I and uh, in terms of the family aspect, one of the social workers at Bally, Allison Marcilla, happens to be on there as well. And she really tends to being a social worker, the family aspects of this to make sure that that's all that that aspect is all connected as well. Um, but um, no, it's uh, it has uh, come from the grassroots. A lot of the different things that that we're doing um, and we're very responsive to that because just like with. My daughter, Mary, the one thing I learned is the parents become the experts. You know, you talk about medical experts, they're resources. The experts on their kid are the parents. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming they love their child. They want the best. They want to learn what, what works, what doesn't work, what other families have gone through, because everybody, um, which is wonderful, this, this fraternity is... E- your organization, you're in this together. I mean, you know, sadly, you lost Mary, but you, your family and this organization been able to help. And, and you've been doing this over 20 years. And, you know, I'm, we're going to take a, a short break. We're going to be back in 30 seconds. We got some amazing stories with Jack Crilly. So come back in 30 seconds, please. The Todd Leonard Show is sponsored by the Leonard Foundation, whose mission is to support the children and families who are battling pediatric cancer and those in need of food and assistance, women's shelters, and other important social services in the community. They also proudly support those fighting pancreatic cancer. They feel it's vitally important to help those in need in our amazing community when they need us the most. Please join them in extending a helping hand and go to leonardcharity.org and donate now. Together, we can touch many lives. Welcome back. I have the great honor again meeting with Jack Crilly. We're talking about the Mary Therese Rose Fund, a wonderful organization that's been in existence over 20 years and has touched so many lives and lifted up so many families. So, Jack, we were talking about this fraternity feel. And, and one of the things that I also would be remiss is the wonderful board you have, all these families are always pulling together. And, you know, I was researching. I have to seem informed for the listeners, and hopefully you feel uh, have some idea about uh, doing justice in your late daughter's honor, is um, I went on your Facebook page, and, and I, it was really striking also just the wonderful feel when I saw it and I read more about your, your fund. What's it like with the board? I mean, you have so many different, diverse, talented people. Um, what's it like to have a group of those folks that are all pulling? And for a common good. Well, these are lifetime bonds and professional bonds, and I, you know, and I have to say, mostly through my wife Lisa, these were predominantly, you know, her contacts through 
Dr. Manganiello being her career mentor and being engaged with our family, and quite frankly, Dr. Manganiello and his partner, Carly Panay, getting us through the five years medically because they had to serve as the pediatricians for Mary. So that's the link. But again, Frank being a visionary in terms of the build-out that I described at Valley Hospital, um, obviously, he should be the president. That's what you want as a president is you want a visionary or whatever. Um, you know, Alice and Marcella, um, you know, for years, my wife would rave about her and just the compassion. Um, you know, one of the things in our journey is that in addition to the Mary Therese Rose one and Mary's, um, uh, you know, Mary's aftermath and what the meaning of her life, my wife and I, as I mentioned to you, we got into foster adoption. And we have a little guy. He's not that little anymore. He's 17 named Joey. So I have Joey, Dominic, and Divine that we got through foster adoption, and Joey's special needs. Joey's got mild Down syndrome. He's the mayor of Wanaku. Um, so, you know, uh, Mayor Mahler, he's a threat, just so you know. <laughs> um, but Joey's got a lot of personality, let's put it that way. So um, there was a grant that was received through Valley Hospital to start, and this is not the Mary Therese Rose Fund, but it's called the Joey Center. It's a support group for Down syndrome or whatever. And it was named after Joey. I said his ego is big enough. So there's a little kangaroo. So I, I'm not I'm not letting Joey take credit for that overall. But just an example of Allison. And as my wife was looking to launch that with Dr. Lisa Nalvin at Valley as well, um, it she is so compassionate, Allison, about reaching out to these families of children with Down syndrome, not the Mary Therese Rose one school, the Joey Center through there. But that's an example of Allison. It's the connection to the hospital and the, and the social work aspect. And again, Ken was a contact professionally of my wife, just a guy. He just didn't put plaster molds on kids and figure out bracing. He put his heart and soul into his career overall. So I'm blessed to have that caliber person. Several years back, we changed the board. I was basically the president for too long. Um, but I guess you need that drive. And it's like any business, right? The entrepreneur has to know when to hand it off. So I'm kind of reverting to my skill set, which really is to be the treasurer of the organization, um, but to kind of be the historian as well so that this group can now take us to the next level. So one of the things also that I was fascinated by, because the whole show is about the journey, the journey of giving back. That's why I do this every week. I want to bring wonderful people on and, and really explore how people find it inside um, to, to go on. So, you know, going back when you lost your beloved daughter in 2003 and now we're in 2022, I mean, and you've already been involved for all these years. Where do you think you got the resiliency, you and your wife, to, to deal with such adversity and be able to rise above it and to be so involved, active in a fund? And also, God bless you for adopting your children. And you have Joe. He sounds like a wonderful young man. Where do you think you got that from you and your wife? You know, it's interesting. And maybe we can talk about this. I'm not going to make it a religious show, but we'll veer into this a little bit on a Sunday morning. But. Um, you know, my daughter, my, my wife was really searching after the passing of my daughter. There was a bit of a grieving gap, very strong marriage, but you're going to find gaps, you know, anywhere. And we just grieved differently. I said, I got to move on. Okay. You know, I, I just kind of forged ahead. My wife couldn't forge ahead. So the Mary Therese Rose Fund, um, was somewhat of a response to that. To be completely honest, there was a bit of self-serving in it, right? Um, but, you know, putting this to productive use. You know, the thing is, life goes on. You don't have a choice, right? So you got to figure it out. And um, so as I was going along and figuring it out, besides the Mary Therese Rose Fund, we kind of settled on my wife being a nurturer, foster care, and then life happens, Right. So sometimes God writes straight with crooked lines. But I, I'd say the inspiration overall was, you know, in terms of my wife um, figuring things out. She read uh, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the one on the streets serving the poor, you know, with her order of nuns. And she just read and she got a lot of inspiration and there a life philosophy kind of developed that, 
and it's very true, you just have to live outside yourself. You've got to serve. Like, your life has to be about service to others because people that get to be insular and internally focused are generally, they're not going to be happy because you're going to, you're, you're not going to focus on your strengths. You're going to focus on your flaws. So when you stop thinking about yourself and you reach out, it's a key to happiness. So, yeah. that, and that's true for anyone, whether or not you have adversity, we all have it at different levels, right? But that's where my wife grew strength, and I think a lot of this emanated out of those readings. You know, it's ironic. Um, I had the great honor. I went before the Roxbury Rotary Club. My great friend Steve Alfred was on last week um, or a few weeks ago. Um, he invited me to talk before the Roxbury Rotarians, so shout out to the Roxbury Rotarians. But their motto was service above self. If not us, then who? Mm -hmm. And that's what you embody as well, the spirit of giving back, looking outside and, and looking beyond inside and go to outside and, and help the world. That, that's awesome that you and your, your wife um, had the resiliency to keep on going and, and do the best you could to help others. Um, I want to talk about some of these other wonderful experiences with the Mary Therese Rose Fund. I want to talk about a beautiful young girl a Girl Scout that wanted to go fishing. And I know that, you know, I'm not a big fisher. You know, my fishing story is my, my buddy, we go fishing years ago in Pennsylvania. We're going freshwater fishing. I am not a fisherman for everyone listening. So he gives me one of his beautiful rods. It's a Shakespeare. This has gone back like 30 years ago. We're there. His buddy had just got terminated from a company. So that, I'll, I'll tell you why that becomes important. So I'm fishing. And I'm like, you know, we're drinking beer and fishing, so I'm having a good time. I'm fishing. All of a sudden, I get something on the hook. I'm pulling, I'm pulling, I'm pulling. And I break the guy's rod. Why? Because the guy that got fired worked for a towel company, and the towel got wrapped around the hook, and I broke his beautiful rod. So that's my fishing skill. So you can invite me to go fishing, but don't give me a good rod. So let's talk about this beautiful young girl, this Girl Scout. Tell us about what your organization was able to do to let her dream come true. And this came from a request from the parents, but this is uh, a young a young lady um, that uh, uh, lived in Bergen County, and um, she had a lot of friends. She was very very popular. Actually, I've met funny through Bank of America. I, I had an opportunity to interview one of her friends who was involved in this story years later, but. Um, she was in a Girl Scout troop in Waldwick, and um, her parents uh, saw the limitations. She, she has cerebral palsy, saw the limitations of the traditional wheelchairs. You've seen wheelchairs. They've got very thin wheels, right? So there's a reason you look at an all-terrain vehicle and they got those big monster wheels because you can go through snow, you can go through mud, you can go through anything. Well, they make wheelchairs like this as well. So... To take her to the shore, to do all these different things, we basically purchased this wheelchair for this, this family. Um, but little did I know that she was attending a Girl Scout camp up in Camp Rickabare in Kinelon, New Jersey. And she was going after a merit badger. She wasn't taking any shortcuts. And I get a picture of her, and here's our wheelchair, right, that... I think this wheelchair might now be in Mary's closet, actually, as a lender. But here she is, waist deep in water in the wheelchair with a fishing pole. And one of her friends, they wheel her right out into the lake, and there she is with this pole, right? And I look at that, and I'm just like, oh, my, you know, it's like she's out there waving in the water fishing because of this thing. Like, we have freed her up and liberated and the other Girl Scouts, like, pushing her through the lake in this thing or whatever. Just think of all the all that's involved in that, the life lessons for the kids, the experience and everything else. It's, it, you know, it's absolutely remarkable. And I think that, um, uh, you know, and I think you grabbed upon that story because it's very representative, I think, of the ripple effect that, that you can have. Oh, the ripple effect. You know, I the DME goes on and they sadly lost their 10 year old son in a tragic accident and they developed kindness for Christopher. And I always think about the ripple effect. If you do something good for someone, you have no idea how it's going to change their life, but also change your life. And we're all in this together. That's one of my mantras too. It's the we generation, 
not the me generation. So that's a beautiful story. When I, when, you know, I was listening to you tell me recently about that, I was like, that is an incredible story to give a severely disabled young girl, a beautiful girl, that opportunity to reclaim the joys of childhood. How important is that to you, Jack, and your organization for the kids to reclaim the joys of childhood? Well, you know, early on when we saw the smiles with the, with the uh, horseback riding, um, my brother, his name is Bruce, who happens to be a, uh, he, he designs logos and he's in marketing and everything. He came up with that mantra, re- reclaiming the joys of, of childhood. And that's a little bit, you know, I, I know my wife's not thrilled with that logo. Why? Because she goes, these kids have joy, even without us. And it's like, it's true. If you have a loving family, you know, without us. So we just aid to that. We're not necessarily reclaiming for them, you know, so that's a little bit of a misnomer. But we are supporting that, if you know what I mean. And there's a, there is a distinction because a child who is loved will have joy. Amen to that. Yep. Amen. A, a child who is loved is going to have joy. And we just help with making some of the experiences um, more attainable. Yeah, I think, like I said, I mean, one of the things I, I put up on Facebook is, you know, bringing joy to special kids, you know, because that means so much to me that you're able to do that, bringing some extra joy. And I agree, if the kids are loved and they're supported, they have joy, but your organization brings it up to a, a, a higher level. Talk to me about the field of dreams the field of dreams. Yeah, well, this is something, and it's in it's in Franklin Lakes. Um, and um, there's a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Jim Herbst um, who uh, made us aware of this. Now, we're not necessarily involved in this, but in Franklin Lakes, they have an astroturf field that is basically um, tailored for special needs uh, kids to play baseball. They call it field of dreams overall. Now, one of the things that we've done ancillary to that, there, we've had some requests for equipment. Um, for example, a custom walker that allows a child to be stabilized at the plate, swing the baseball bat, unlatch it, and with the walker make their way down to first first base overall. But uh, that's something that Jim Herbst had made us aware of in Franklin Lakes. Franklin Lakes had that program. It's AstroTurf, obviously, for the consistency of surface or whatever. But, yeah, just field of dreams, opportunity for special needs kids to play baseball. Wonderful. I mean, yeah. once again, another example. What, I know on, um, you have the Wall of Wishes. What's the Wall of Wishes? Well, the Wall of Wishes is really, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's really just um, for us to get a barometer um, in, in, in terms of the programs that people value m- most. So, it's really more of a fundraising type of a thing, uh, but it also serves a bit of a – gives us a little polling information. And, you know, you'll see on our wall, do you want to support Saturday Stars, equipment purchases, medical reimbursements, therapeutic riding or whatever. Um, and so we will then dedicate, you know, a contribution to that particular area. So – it, it, the wall of wishes um, is basically the ability of donors to um, target what activity they want us to be funding. All right. Their well, donation. One, you obviously, you need funds to run the organization. Right. If someone listening again wants to reach you, what, what's the best way to reach your fund? Uh, org. So I know that you have some annual uh, fundraising events, and um, I know um, how important it is the families and the kids can enjoy that, too. Um, how does that evolve over time, the annual fundraisers? One of the decisions that we made is that our fundraisers serve a dual purpose. They just don't raise money but they become events for the families. So we have two major ones. So we get outside donations year round. But the two major events, one is coming up next Saturday at Darlington Park in Mawa and it's our 5K. Um and then on t- and then we're going to have at Fountain Spring Lake in Ringwood coming up this year September 25th. Well, we called it Ho Down last year, but it's a country western theme, a wonderful facility or whatever with all kinds of activities for the kids. And so, so that serves kind of as our fundraising dinner. And for the most part, when we solicit donations for tables and things, it is the understanding that, um, you know what, 
we're just not going to have a corporation buy a table and force reluctant employees and only know which charities to go there. We want those tickets donated so these kids, we can have an event tailored to them. And the donors that do come see what's going on and see the kids, you know. So it's not as sterile as a lot of the fundraisers are. Now, do we sacrifice some money? Yeah, particularly at the hoedown. Um, you don't get as as your silent auction doesn't bid up as much, if you know what I mean, because you're helping families that are in need or whatever, but we will make that sacrifice any day. This coming Saturday, May 7th at Darlington, though, stepping off at 10 in the morning, we have our 5K race that, with the pandemic, has been virtual over the past two years. So we are now returning. It's going to be held exclusively within the park. Um Last year, and Todd, I think our connection was is that you got a referral through the Duhame family. Last year on May 4th, we get a phone call finding out that the husband of one of the coordinators of the event, event Tara Duhame, that her husband had suddenly passed away. Our virtual event was scheduled for May 8th. We just said put on the brakes. Like we're not, you know, so whatever, um, you know, whatever people want to do is fine, but we just kind of truncated the whole thing at that point in time. Um, we have two individuals who organize the race. It's Laura Matos and Tara. I then called up Laura, and this is part of the fraternity. They've become like best friends through their experiences with the Mary Therese Rose Fund. And I said, you know, Laura... Due to the contributions of the Duhame family, um, I've spoken to the board about this, and they're all with agreement. Let's give the race to the Duhame family and let them memorialize Rich, um, which is what we did. And you'll say, life is incredible. What does that mean? Well, that was Rich. Rich, although passing suddenly, did have... Um, a, a medical condition, I won't disclose what it is overall, but had a buoyant optimism. And so when we gave the event to Tara, Tara said, you know what? I don't want this to be pictures or whatever about Rich. I want it to be about his spirit. And that's what he was. And he'd, one of his sayings was, and it may sound simple, life is incredible. In his handwriting, that's what's on there and everything. And so you're talking about someone with this buoyant optimism all the time. And that was his impact on people, just simple buoyant optimism, you know, to his family and his extended friends or whatever that were trying to make the race reflect his spirit overall. So that's coming up this May 7th. And again, information on that is at www.marytreasrose.org. There's a link on top of that run sign up. Run sign up. I'm going to throw everyone a curveball. MTRF. Or life is incredible. If you put in those keywords in the run sign up, you can access the race overall. Yeah, you know, and m m once again, when I heard about what happened with Rich, I never had the great privilege and honor to, to meet him, but I heard wonderful things about him. And that's one of the things, too, about life. You never know when crazy stuff is, is going to happen. But the way he lived his life seems like he was an incredible person and so optimistic. You know, this is one of the keys, too, in life. If you hang around people that are optimistic, Good things are going to happen. You hang around people that are always negative, everything that's wrong instead of everything that's right, it's going to impact you. So that's the legacy he's leaving behind for his wife and his kids and for your organization to live a life of really a, a great life. So when you think about, you know, the things that you're doing to lift up the special kids, how does it make you feel inside that you've been really one of your missions is to do this, to look outside for this, this, this one of the keys to life. How do you think it's enriched your life, Jack? So, and I think as a lot of 17 year olds or whatever, um, I made a decision to make money going to college and my ground floor was to be a CPA. Okay, great. So I did that. Now, my wife always had more of a mission towards special needs, so she always had a bigger heart than I did. Um, and I have to tell you from my younger self to now, um, I don't want to say that I was forced into this because I didn't exactly resist it, but it kind of came upon me. Um, 
and it's just made me happier and fulfilled. So with the Bank of America Private Bank, we, and particularly my role, I'm in a great group, a lot of fun. You know, it's funny, you get a skill set or whatever, and then when it gets second nature, it becomes about people, and I'm, I'm able to practice that. But at the end of the day, my mission is to serve the fortunate overall. And so sometimes you sit back and you go, God, how do you justify that career, right? And you, you sit back, and number one, if through my experience and they get to know me, I can give them that aspect of their life, I can serve in that way. But number two, um, I've had to decide that my life and my role is to support others that are doing good, right? Not that I'm not doing good, but support others in their mission. So besides my wife being a pediatric physical therapist, my three adult children, um, I have twins, so I can't say oldest necessarily. Maybe by minutes I could, but my um, my uh, one of my twins, she went to the University of Scranton, got her uh, DPT, her doctorate in physical therapy, and she is now um, at the Carriker Center as well with my wife in this field with the passion and the zeal that my wife brings to this overall. My other two, who actually went to Seton Hall University to the education school, my one daughter, Gina, is at Saddlebrook, and she does um, preschool handicapped, and she's um, studied further to be a behavioralist for special needs children. My son, Matt, who lives out in Rockaway Township, actually, is on White Meadow Lake, he is um, working in special needs inclusion, fifth grade inclusion in Harrison, New Jersey, and dedicating his life to inner city children in those populations as well. Um, they love what they do and they have a passion for it, right? So I look back and I'm like, you know, I, I'm like, I, I think I know what my, what my space in life is. You know, that's very rewarding to just, you know, know who you are and, and, and know what your place on this globe is, you know, and, um, and so that's kind of how it's enriched me. It just took the, the edge off of, you know, success and money and all that kind of stuff, you know, because, you know, you all have goals, but sometimes you don't hit them and you got to modify. And sometimes, you know, like, you know, God writes straight with crooked lines and, and you got to read those, you know. Right. So one of the things, Jack, too, I know how much pride you take in your kids and you should. I mean, they're very giving, loving, compassionate kids. And I know you reflect on it with the sad passing of your beloved daughter, Mary Therese Rose, in 2003. It really impacted the whole trajectory of the family and how you guys have always been, I'm sure, giving people. But this has now really changed their lives, your lives, your wife's life, your children's lives. You have adopted a children, which is a beautiful thing to do. Um what does it mean to be a giver uh, in terms of making it a lifestyle? Why why is that important to you? Because you're not self-absorbed, I guess. Like I said, why is it important? And, and this is a lesson that's learned. Um, I, I think to be happy and satisfied, you just have to get outside of yourself. So giving by its nature is you're giving a, giving a portion of yourself um, and what I would say, and I would say to the audience is don't make it a box checking exercise. Don't do it because your employer says you got to do it right. Um, don't do it because it's an obligation. Don't do it because, oh, I got to go to this charitable event. It's where I got to be seen, right? If you do have to be seen, make sure that you have a passion for where you're being seen. If you know what I mean, right? So if it's a charity that, you know, it's like, oh, God, I got to be seen here or whatever, fine. Don't put your heart and soul in it. But there are going to be things and causes to put your heart and soul and to truly give. Um, and, um, you know, and no matter what you do, you'll be able to, um, you know, justify yourself to yourself, you know, in your own heart. Yeah, you know, Jack, you, you said a lot of things, uh, you know, what we've been talking about today is um, on the journey is when you get a little older, let's say you have some moderate success financially, 
you have to look inside and say, wait a minute, what can I do to help others? What can I do to lift others up? What can I do to also enrich my soul? Because everybody has to support themselves. I totally get that. But I know in my life, the more I give back, the better I feel. The financial, I'm blessed, I'm fortunate, but I always feel so much more satisfied when I'm lifting up someone, when I'm involved. And you should be really proud about your mentality as well. You know, everybody wants the keys to happiness, right? I mean, because, I mean, let's think about it. I mean, the world is a pressure cooker at time. What do you think your keys to happiness has been now that you kind of reflect on your life? Well... First of all, um, you know, and and, and um, I, I do have a rhythm to my life, so I do have a consistency. I, as crazy as my schedule is, and people say, oh "My God, he does all these things," but I th- there's just a level of consistency that I have. You know, I've been very blessed that, like my my wife and I have known each other and started dating later in high school, and to find a soulmate at that age and just to be so compatible. And then to have that gap, as I mentioned, that grieving gap, and then being able to solve for that and further cementing a, a relationship and a marriage overall. So it emanates from a just a fantastic, loving wife and marriage, um, you know. And so now you got that cornerstone, and then you build off of that. Um, and, um, you know, I have to say, I had to be led to this. And my wife's not preachy or whatever, but she, like... Just the innocence and the and the 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 giving heart that early on when I was younger used to frustrate me. It's like I want to do this, I want to do that, and she was always serving people, and that's what she wanted to do. I had to learn lessons, and that's a result of a of a good marriage to kind of mature into where I am at this point right now. Um, so I have a consistency, a craziness, but a consistency to my life and a rhythm to my life. And it's focused on giving. And I have to say that I got it from my better half. Well, God bless you and, and your your beloved wife, Lisa, and um, your angel, Mary Therese Rose. I'm a better person, Jack, to meet you in person and to learn your story and your journey. You know, it means so much. You take time out of your weekend and, and to come here and, and to honor. It's been an honor to have you here. And also, you're, you're the angel in heaven. She'd be really proud about how you conducted yourself, you and your wife and your kids and everything you stand for, because that's the kind of beautiful people I like to bring on the show. It enriches my life to know people like you. So for the listeners, I want you to think about what Jack Crilly's about. He lost his beloved angel, but he's risen above that. He has been able to lift so many. He has been able to carry on a beautiful legacy, to give back to lend a hand up. We all have gifts in lives. We should use them to help others. Remember, we're in this together. The more you help someone, the more you're going to help yourself too. So once again, think about that. When you have a chance in life to make somebody's life better, do it. You'll be so happy inside. God bless you. Please tune in next Sunday. We have an amazing show with the dynamic duo. We'll be talking about miracles. God bless and enjoy this wonderful day. The Todd Leonard Show is sponsored by the Leonard Foundation, whose mission is to support the children and families who are battling pediatric cancer and those in need of food and assistance, women's shelters, and other important social services in the community. They also proudly support those fighting pancreatic cancer. They feel it's vitally important to help those in need in our amazing community when they need us the most. Please join them in extending a helping hand and go to LeonardCharity.org and donate now. Together, we can touch many lives.